I believe that music surpasses even language in its power to mirror the innermost recesses of the human soul. George Crumb. Keeping this quote in mind, what does the music of Despel Omega say about the human soul? What follows will be a snapshot of a greater work to come. I also want to take this moment to say that there will undoubtedly be mispronunciations, so apologies ahead of time. As well, I'm no musicologist, so for those who are more academically inclined in this way, apologies ahead of time as well. If we missed anything you are interested in or have questions about, we would love to hear from you, so feel free to share your thoughts with us. Lastly, for copyright reasons, we are unable to include clips to illustrate the points, so be sure to check the description for a list of the referenced pieces as well as other relevant music. To begin, it goes without saying that Despel Omega are black metal. The musical motifs this genre uses are fairly well covered at this point, but to reiterate, it's all about alienation, isolation, and entrainment. With any repetitive practice, things tend to get worn out, something Despel realized fairly early in their tenure, eventually referring to standard black metal music and lyrical content as a first order rebellion. For that reason, we will be covering their music from C Monumentum onwards. In keeping with the traditions of absence and excess, let's first look at the roles of silence and cacophony, which are guided by the overall dynamic choices in a piece of music. Silence, or rests, are most often used to open the aural spectrum to allow other instruments to be highlighted, or to create an expectant tension. When the latter is juxtaposed with complex instrumentation, the psychoacoustic results are more drastic. An example of this is Scriabin's Opus 60 titled Prometheus, Poem of Fire. Scriabin's use of dynamics affect the mood, routinely starting with a lighter arrangement to be eventually overtaken by much louder parts, specifically the piano and horn sections. Another more drastic example is Penderecki's Passacaglia movement from his third symphony. The low, repeating ostinato creates thematic space between its hits and the emptiness between. It is also important to consider the extremes, which, in the case of Cacophony, would also be exemplified by Penderecki's Threnody for the Victims of Hiroshima or Ligeti's Atmospheres, both of which have sections where the arrangement and accompanying intensity thereof become more animalistic than musical. In the case of Silence, John Cage's 433 will undoubtedly come to mind, which is just 4 minutes and 33 seconds of silence, filled only by the sounds of the audience and the room. What some have supposed to be a provocation for meaning itself in relation to musical apperception. How does Despel Omega use this dynamic? To those familiar, the examples will immediately stick out. Perhaps the best example would be the interludes between songs on Foss, or the Zimmerman sample toward the beginning of Kenoza, or the No Man Can See Me and Live transition from track three of the same record. However, what I consider to be the most thematically resonant example is the difference between the majority of C Monumentum and its interruption by the sorrowful Hymn of the Cherubim in Carnal Malefactor. Considering the more exoteric themes of that record, the pregnant, relative pause due to the dynamics during the section are perfectly aligned with the birth of Christ into the flesh. Even though obvious to specify, time plays a crucial role in how dynamics unfold. To subject this tyrannical force to doubt is another manner in which Despel Omega express meaning musically, and they do this in a variety of ways. The backmasking and first prayer underneath the religious chant is an inversion of the old world order of religious institutions, while simultaneously suggesting that the old world order itself was subverted all along by its establishment in a world without objective underpinnings for rules, laws, or normative ethics. In other words, the world of nature. The hubris invoked by mankind's desire to overtake that which is foundational to its very existence is intimately important to understanding how Despel might view man as a collective entity, a contradiction and a circularly progressing mistake. This is highlighted by the concept of mazes, as seen on Periclitus or Furnaces. However, this is not to suggest a conclusively antenatal stance, but a more nuanced argument about the state in which we find ourselves. Evidence to this is the use of time on Foss, where it's more structural than musical. Foss uses time in a much different way by bracketing the record between the shadow of obombration. This suggests that eventually, somewhere within the illusion of time between, one realizes the spiritual fate of mankind is everlasting, or, in a metaphysically identical move, never was. This is why the fall, in the context of Foss, might conceivably last forever, because philosophically, there can be no differentiation in the most extreme forms of experience, experiences which are, at the end of the day, all too human. That being said, the last unmentioned aspect of time to be covered is the idea of repetition. 
earlier, I mentioned entrainment as an aspect to the classic modus operandi of black metal. The most significant way this was and is accomplished is through repetition. Another way this is accomplished is by tonal qualities, but more on that later. As far as repetition, perhaps the best example of this can be heard in the instrumental works by Burzum, such as Der Tad Wutans or Tomhet, but this has many counterparts in classical music as well. Consider the piece Chromatic Canon by James Tenney, a minimalist work that moves two pianos through shifting sections that seem to dissonantly blend one into the next in a quasi-serialist glean. The effect this has on the listener is one of being pulled into its tide. Not surprisingly, the piece is dedicated to the minimalist landmark Steve Reich, whose work Piano Phase is the quintessential example of this theory of composition. Therein, Reich plays a single piano phrase over each other simultaneously, one of which is only slightly slower. The effect this has is an ever-changing rhythm and accentuation of different sections of the phrase. Listening to this piece is like watching sand cymatically form different shapes on a flat plane in response to an increasing frequency. Lastly, the Leo section from George Crumb's second volume of Macrocosmos titled The Magic Circle of Infinity uses a cyclically repeating motif that is only repeated a few times but feels as though it could continue indefinitely. The thing all the aforementioned pieces share is the closer focus on time and its passage. However, through the repetitions and resulting accents and undulations, the Lorcan, quote, broken arches where time suffers, end quote, become the foci, breaking the entrainment provided, but also further dragging the listener into its subtle tyranny. Now, consider the sections in Despel's music where this theoretical approach takes precedent, such as the length of the section from the beginning of Diabolus Absconditus, specifically the slowly altered approach in performance during the guitar arpeggiation. This supports the themes of that piece, the slowly coming to be not in the gaze of the Edwardian sacred vulva or the psychotropic apprehension of insistent sounds to be further manifest. The repeating motif of Epiclesis II and Apocatastasis Panton suggest an expiration of time and descent to whatever comes afterward, especially in the latter's cyclical disintegration and the ontological expression given by the descending baseline. In a Hegelian sense, mustn't the inverse negate and re-establish itself by also holding true the same qualities in spite of its performative opposition? In other words, instead of repetitive ostinatos or motifs, could not a single ringing tone or note accomplish the same entraining qualities? This does happen to contain a similar temporal tyranny, such as in the case of ambient, drone, or some contemporary classical music, to name a few examples. The song with the Tony Conrad collaboration with Hanged Up titled Principles, which has a single, double-tracked, therefore slightly wavering note, which continues throughout the entirety of the song, holding it all together while the drums and effects threaten to destroy it. As well, the first movement from the Shelshi Symphony, Ion, uses notes held at length to expectant effect. It's a wonderful piece, and although an example of many things we're talking about today, it truly shines when it comes to this aspect. Listening to the entirety of Ion gives one the impression of traversing colossal distances of time. As well, the fantastic Morton Feldman album, Rothko Chapel, the granular synthesis of Stars of the Lid, and the droning tectonics of Sun and Hive Mind each hold similar qualities. But why is it important to bring this up, as Despel Omega mostly engage with busier, more complex music? While this is true in aggregate, there are certainly moments of suspension such as Sallow Vision, the bass and root in general on First Prayer, the interludes on Foss, and so on. While it may seem like the preceding thoughts are simply dynamics by another name, there is a sonically metatheoretical application going on. In following the lyrics, the music must hold its own weight thematically. In the same way, the complex, discordant arrangements exhaust the listener, cause us to lose track of time, the relative silence in the quiet parts accomplishes the same end. Surely, time is not there to simply be erased or that from which we are entrained away. Time is also extremely important for Despel, insofar as it's required for a story to unfold, both for us, but also as an independent, objective narrative unavailable to us directly. The music is the same, in its reliance upon time and commitment to remove time by its own principles. A perfected expression of this notion can be found in the glissandi-laden piece from Gloria Coates' Ninth Symphony, titled Homage to Van Gogh. The entraining qualities of Coates' work is twofold, repetition and tonality which is accomplished by mixing the timbral qualities of the various instruments with a universal theory of performance. In its apprehension, the work is Pendrekian in its animalism, yet in complete opposition to the latter's commonly referenced style. But how is this possible? 
Perhaps an aside, but interesting nonetheless, the simpler or more complex music is spectrally, the more it resembles its other on the opposite side of the spectrum. When we move to one extreme side or the other, we find that eventually we become confused as to which side on that spectrum we have actually journeyed. At a certain point, pure noise becomes a singular tone, while a sustained tone will often produce the effect of hallucinatory complexity. Well, what about atonality, at which Despel is much more fluent? Why the reliance on it? There is an obvious answer to that question, and it's relative to the Western tradition and our psychological biases. According to McDermott and Oxenham, quote, The aesthetic response to an interval or chord is also a function of the musical context. With appropriate surroundings, a dissonant interval can be quite pleasurable, and often serves important musical functions. However, in isolation, Western listeners consistently prefer some intervals to others, and this depends little on musical training. End quote. Dissonance, whether a tritone, a minor second, or otherwise, is commonly found to be unpleasurable and alienating to the Western listener, which is precisely why black metal has historically relied upon it. Acoustically, dissonance is more active, more chaotic than consonant intervals, such as a perfect fourth, fifth, or an octave. This is because the frequencies involved are battling each other for prominence, while undercutting each other so that none can actually find it. Psychoacoustically, the emergent property this causes is why dissonance sounds the way it does. And assuredly, there are cultural and psychological exceptions to this, but they're just that. There are a few methods Despel Omega use to achieve dissonance. There's the obvious tritonic approach, as heard on the guitar arpeggios from Diabolus Absconditus, or chordally, as heard throughout Foss, or as something in between, what might be considered a cluster arpeggio, such as the opening guitar from Wings of Predation. For examples to the counter, consider Arvo Pert, George Crumb's Madrigals, or even Orthodox religious melodies, all of which offer a more traditional use of tritones, or as a moment of tension toward a resolution. In addition to that, Despel will add a minor ninth on top of a three-note tritone for an extra level of tonal discordance, and they do this all the time. Wings of Predation, again, Repellent Scars, Kinoza One, and so on. Lastly, they excel at voice leading, which is the act of progressing a melodic line to create intercordal harmonies. In a contemporary rock context, this is often heard as the note changes between chords in a progression. My favorite example of this for Despel is the opening guitar on Kenoza 3. But another great example would be the part on Fires of Frustration that starts at roughly two minutes into the song. Oftentimes, voice leading is a technique for melodic counterpoint, which often have two or more melodic voices, such as Bach's musical offering. Despel Omega, however, use voice leading to move from one dissonant pit to another, with brief moments of consonance between, thus inverting the traditional theoretical applications of dissonance. So if dissonance is useful in subverting the mainline conventions of traditional Western melody and harmony, might it also be more left-handedly articulate to employ microtonal systems, which in some sense move beyond this as a simple polarity? Maybe, but they don't use microtonal tunings with their music. They create music within the context of the Western chromatic scale. That being said, there is an argument to be made about what we mean by microtonal. One could say that some of the composers mentioned thus far are microtonal, insofar as Coates, Ligeti, and Penderecki, to name a few, use glissandi and other techniques to hit emotional depths between the 12 notes we commonly experience. There is a difference, though, between that and figures like Charles Ives, Ivan Vizhnagrodsky, or Adam Kalmbach, who actively use or used microtonal tunings to explore some of these deeper places. This is, in a symbolic way, why Deathspell Omega sampled Vizhnagrodsky on Foss, considering the themes of that record. That being said, there are some moments of a soft microtonality. On some songs, there is a sense of improvisation that isn't directly apparent. The musicological term for this is indeterminacy, meaning that spots in a composition are left intentionally open so performers can inject their own subjectivity into it, which yields, according to John Cage, quote, the ability of a piece to be performed in substantially different ways, end quote. This is most readily apparent on the Foss record, specifically on the repellent scars of Abandon and Election, where certain parts are played slightly differently each time around, giving a sense of the uncanny to the listener and inserting something of a psychological microtonality as the listener attempts to understand why it's not quite right. 
As it happens to be, another great example of this is Aretha Franklin's version of Chain of Fools, where the guitar plays something a little differently every time around. As well, Despel Omega used a lot of bends while playing chords and arpeggios, which detunes the guitar and gives the music an animalistic feel, much in the same way Portal evokes the Lovecraftian by their technique with bends. There's also other ways that have to do with guitar effects and overall production approaches that detune the guitar, which have been misunderstood as microtonal. Even though only proximally related to a musical interpretation, the production of a record is, especially in the case of Despel Omega, an aspect of the music that is just as important to the themes of their work. Firstly, it's important to understand what is meant by production. For our purposes, it means the technical choices and aspects of the recording, mixing, and or mastering processes of creating music for widespread release, as opposed to the creative direction of the music itself. So there is no producer per se with what we're talking about, except the band itself for all intents and purposes. A thematic statement itself worth extracting. Consider the production from C Monumentum, its lower quality reminiscent of the lower worldly sphere in which, in the same context as the lyrics, the music finds its target audience. Additionally, the phaser effect on the guitar on Diabolus Absconditus, the muddiness of the mix on Foss, and the analog approach to furnaces are all thematic choices, heightening the respective concepts with which those records are engaging. An outside example of using production as an effect, as well as the overall delivery and interpretation of a piece, would be something like Alvin Lucier's I Am Sitting in a Room. In this piece of experimental minimalism, Lucier recorded himself saying a sentence, then playing it back in a particular room and re-recording, doing this over and over until what's left is the standing waves of resonance, highlighting not the audio itself, but how it interacts with the space. David Byrne makes the point in his book, How Music Works, that music is often created for particular spaces, as in the case of religious music in large cathedrals, punk rock in small clubs, and so on. Deathspell Omega's musical space is, if anything discreet, the studio. However, the telos is the listener, thus the music is not meant to stay in the studio, but engage with a wide variety of possible spaces. What is important is the manner in which they choose to record, such as the furnaces of Palingenesia, or what they choose to record, such as the instrumentation or samples they include. In the case of furnaces, it was recorded live in the studio to analog equipment. The result of this choice yields a particular frenetic and immediate quality, mirroring, once again, the themes behind the lyrics. This leaves the music, to borrow the words of the band, concrete, material, palpable, contemporary. We mentioned before the Vizhnagrodsky sample from Foss, but that, along with the low drone sweeps, laughter in the background, and other vocal samples such as choirs, all point toward the meaning they are trying to convey. The most obvious hallmark from Foss is the arrangement itself, the chaotic wall of music suggesting a similar chaos within the heart of the one falling. When it comes to instrumentation, that is a potentially wide and subjective area to explore, so we're just going to focus on a couple things we find interesting in this episode. The use of horns and the vocals. The symbolic role of horns has a long history. There are many reasons horns were blown, such as the pronouncement of an arrival of some kind, a declaration of war, or manner of intimidation during war, such as the German Stuka siren, the announcement of a sacrifice, or the signaling of the beginning of something, such as a hunt. In terms of an arrival, we see this uh, all over the Bible, such as the coming of the Son of Man or some other divine being. This serves to auditorily rupture the sonic space, to the extent that there is a significant difference worth attention. The Hebrews used horns for a variety of reasons, such as the blasting of the shofar horn during Rosh Hashanah or during a funerary rite. During war, the intimidation factor serves the same purpose as the announcement of a divine being. There is about to be an actionable difference in how people are reacting to their space after the horn has stopped blowing. In this way, the use of a horn engenders expectation or difference. The correlation of divinity and violence here is not a mistake, as, in the words of Baudrillard via Roderick, War is real if anything is. What is angelic confrontation but a war against one's senses? In one interpretation, that is what the music of Despel Omega represents. It's a symbolic announcement of things to come, of a being worthy of attention as a force of change, and so on. Concerning vocals, the use of choirs is important wherever they are used. Their use on C Monumentum suggests the intermingling of the sacred and the profane, the divine and the filthy, a la base materialism and the Schillingian unground. The effect of this is a coinciding positing of the spirit and eruption of its power in the physical. 
For Canosa and Foss, choirs are a Dionysian expression of madness and ecstasy, and the rupture of non-knowledge. This highlights the same notion, but only shifts the relative perspective. For example, on C. Monumentum, the focus is the homogeneous earth as monument, while on Foss, it's toward the disillusion of the self and the heterogeneous. Like musical arrangement and its abuse, these uses of traditionally styled vocals are dependent upon Western culture and history. However, the style of the main vocal sections are a relatively new development in music. A lot has been said about the vocals in heavy music, the evolution and instrumental necessity of the progression from clean singing to the prominent styles now in use. This progression parallels the themes heavy music illustrates, and as such requires an examination, but vocal distortion has many theoretical uses we can understand outside of a purely musical context. Consider the experimental group Current 93. A couple examples are the record Nature Unveiled and the song I Have a Special Plan for This World. These examples share the particular approach of dehumanizing the voice, mostly through effects, particularly the static, bit-mapped sound of the sections between the readings from the latter. This suggests the subjective erasure of the subject, a Jungian disintegration edging an overlay of the uncanny real onto the familiar. The vocal technique used by many, if not all, extreme metal vocalists has the same teleological aim. Miko Ashba presents an interesting case in relation. His vocal style, while typical of the genre, has a certain enunciative quality to it that makes it easier to understand the lyrics. This narratory technique checks off the subjective erasure and dehumanization boxes, but leaves a sense of agency and will on the part of the vocals, giving the listener the sense of an outsideness entering into the world of action. To use Kabbalistic terms, the vocals then are representative of the Deot, which is a site of infinite unification, but also the connection point between spirit and matter. It is also useful to differentiate between the vocal styles used, and there are five main points of differentiation. Whispered, spoken, tortured, shouted, and the main approach we just covered. For whispered, some standout moments include the desperation in second prayer, the ecstatic Lama Sabachthani's from Kinoza 3, and the exhaustive whispers from the outside throughout Foss, but specifically the call and response on repellent scars. Spoken vocal parts suggest moments of thematic importance, such as dearth or the sample at the beginning of Diabolus Absconditus. Tortured vocals are perhaps the most frenzied form of humanistic expression, to the extent that the fragility of the human body and mind in relation to the realizations given forth via Bataille, etc., play a central role in the discourse. Most notably, the last of these words section during A Chore for the Lost expresses this. Contrarily, shouted vocals represent an attempted shoring up of human strength, such as the second and third prayers and the second obombration. To end, the topics we have covered in exploring the aforementioned musical and vocal qualities all pull the listener towards the themes presented by Despel Omega. The main point here is the universality of that pull, or entrainment, which is, in turn, yet another meta-narrative the band uses to get its message across. As an agent interacting with a powerful and or all-pervasive force such as capital, evil, impossibility, and so on, there is a particular bringing into and left behindness that is imperative to their ability to exist in the first place. This is the concern for, as stated in the first Bardo Methodology interview, quote, the conduit, man, and his biotope, this planet, end quote. The battalion necessity and promise via sovereignty and impossibility is, as such, for the human. In any instance of entrainment, one is locking into, or more accurately, becoming entrapped by an environmental force. At this time, let's revisit the George Crumb quote from the beginning. I believe that music surpasses even language in its power to mirror the innermost recesses of the human soul. Whatever promise given to us by the notion of a soul has to come into question when considering the power music has to elevate, degrade, and suspend the subject in its potency. And sure, Crumb is referencing an aesthetic power, but an aesthetic experience is an experience of non-being. So what was there to mirror exactly except the sublime, the shudder, ugliness and beauty, and impossibility? In another word, silence. It's this silence, ironically apprehended by hearing in this case, of physical phenomena which entrain us into its aesthetic gravity, giving an exuberant yet brief glimpse into a timelessness without us.